Hello magpies, and it's time for another foray into the cultures and national identities of the Forgotten Realms. This series will give you an introduction to playing in over 40 different nations of Faerun, to the backdrop of my own variant narrative, but just as useful in the core setting. Today, we make an expedition into the cold lands of the Northern Palatinate and swoop over some thinly veiled critiques of colonialism. Let us begin. The Northern Palatinate is home to the Damaran people who supported Thay against Cormia in the Great War. Today, the North is a troubled land in the shadow of old empires and under the yoke of cruel ambition. It is a land of pragmatic, salt-of-the-earth folk who are unconcerned with heroes and with kings. No small wonder, given that their leaders have earned a reputation for cloak and dagger intrigue. None more so than the Palatinate ruler King Vladimir Obaskir of Impultur, who seeks to emulate his uncle, the late Emperor Azun, by carving out an empire of his own and achieving immortality as the first king to tame the North. Today, Impultur is capital of the North. But until recently, it was occupied by its neighbours, Damara and the Vast. Presenting himself as a peacekeeper, King Vladimir acquired sophisticated gunpowder weaponry from Chondath, and leading a vast force of Turmish mercenaries, he liberated Impultur from its occupation and became their monarch. Thereafter, Rather than sue for peace, Vladimir stoked nationalism and inflamed grievances in his court to justify a colonial expansion of his lands. Though the land grab has reached a tentative ceasefire as Vladimir publicly cleanses himself of sin by lending his support to the Raven's Banner Crusade, there is no doubt in anyone's mind that once he is purified, he shall return to the bloody business of conquest, unabated. Indeed, his practice of using mercenary armies means that very few Impulturians must ever confront the realities of war, and this renders them susceptible to their monarch's honeyed words promising a united north under Impulturian rule. Inhabitants of Impultur speak Damaran as their common tongue, and they may choose regional equipment reflecting the dangerous line that one must walk in troubled times. To live through intrigue, taking studded leather armor and thieves' tools, to want only to survive, take taking a potion of eagle splendor to evade danger, or to trust in skill at arms, taking a long sword or a great sword. The major faiths of Impultur are Helm, Ilmata, Lathanda, Salune, Tempus, Timora, Valka, and Joaquin. On a storyboard, Impultur is a one-for-one -one analog of imperialism and the nationalist imperatives that, lie, that lead to the rise of despots. It evokes the depersonalization effect of warfare, fought by foreign mercenaries who hold no connection to the land or to the people whose blood they spill. And all of it, all of it, for a king who only adopts a national identity to advance his own ambitions. These unsubtle analogues are set to an aesthetic undertone of Russia during the time of the Tsars. 
once home to a mighty orcish empire and having since been conquered many times. The inhabitants of the vast are no stranger to warfare. Therefore, their current occupation by the armies of King Vladimir is taken with a certain degree of fatalism, belying a simmering rage below the surface that awaits opportunity for its expression. While traditionally the vast has lacked a central government, their current predicament has led to a resistance movement that aims to liberate and to unify the whole region as the emergent nation of Vesperin. Until that day, the vast remains a harsh land of forced labor and of oppression where one must be strong in order to survive. Inhabitants of the vast speak Damaran as their common tongue and those who are less physically powerful may take three potions of healing to aid them through these dark times. Others who embrace the, nas the nation's warlike past may take a fearsome suit of spiked banded mail. Spiked armor is an orcish innovation that deals one point of piercing damage to anyone who makes a grapple check against the wearer. It also increases the wearer's unarmed attack damage to 1d4 piercing damage. The major faiths of the Vast are Helm and Lathanda being the imposed religions of their occupiers, as well as the native religions of Chontia, Clangedon Silverbeard, Eldath, Mistra, Tempus, Torm, Timora, and Joaquin. Continuing the theme of colonialism, the vast outlines the worst objectifications of imperialism upon the colonized. Think pre-revolutionary Haiti with an aesthetic flair of the Germanic tribes. Damara is a sparsely populated, mineral-rich country north of Impultur. Although it has been invaded by King Vladimir, he is far more concerned with plundering Damaran mineral wealth than with controlling the populace. So the forests and the mountains serve as staging grounds where resistance forces may mobilize. These freedom fighters have formed a defensive coalition with elements within their neighbor Vasa. This agreement is called the Bloodstone Pact and calls for both nations to aid in the other's defense. While with uh, there is even some talk of unification of Damara and Vasa after Impultur is defeated. The people of Damara are hardy and strong, used to defending their homes from undead legions overflowing from the uninhabitable regions to their north. Inhabitants of Damara speak Damaran, unsurprisingly, and they may take regional equipment of either a longsword or a battle axe representing a determination to defend their homes. Or they may take two scrolls of cure wounds as healers are highly valued in their society. And finally, those with a mercantile background, or those having recently escaped from one of King Vladimir's mining camps, may take 300 gold worth of bloodstones. The major faiths of Damara are Ilmata and Sylvanus with Tempus revered among the barbarian tribes. Damara reflects historical analogues of the frontiers of colonial power. It has echoes of the environs of Hadrian's Wall under Roman rule, or of pagan Lithuania under Teutonic occupation. Vasa is a harsh, 
cold land. Formerly ruled by a lich known as Zheng Yi the Witch King. Now it is controlled by brutal feudal lords known as the Warlock Knights of Vasa. Their military skill in aid to Damara confounds King Vladimir's expansion, but beneath the surface, forces within Vasa aim to use this war to exhaust and to overextend their warlock rulers, seeking to achieve their overthrow, and then to forge a united, a new united confederacy between Damara and Vasa. Inhabitants of Vasa speak Damaran as their common tongue, and they must live or die by the sword or by their wits. They may take either a set of splint mail, having been pressed into military service, or they may take either a warhammer or a mace as being the chosen weapons of their people. Or, if they seek to live and advance through subterfuge, they may take a potion of shadow mask, which when drunk conceals their facial features and gives a 50% chance to avoid gaze attacks for 10 minutes. The major faiths of Vasa are the Dwarven Pantheon and the Orcish Pantheon, oddly enough, as humans must live under tyrants who tend to outlaw worship of the gods and demand supplication to their warlock patrons alone. Vasa evades historical analogues, except perhaps for some caricature of a city dweller's fear of godless barbarians living beyond the limits of civilization. Vasa is a foil against life, against freedom and against joy, and it is an ideal enemy for stories that demand an uncomplicated evil set to the extrema of frozen frontiers. North of the Dale Lands is the Moon Sea, being the westernmost region of the Northern Palatinate. It is a wild and untamed, albeit wealthy, frontier of oligarchic city-states with no central authority and plenty of despotic rulers. Currently untouched by the wars to the east, the leaders of this land are said to be uninterested in much anything else other than fighting over control of the fertile farmland and wealthy trading lanes in the southern part of the country. Inhabitants of the Moon Sea speak Damaran as their common tongue, and they may take as their regional equipment a weapon unique to the Moon Sea. Named a two-bladed sword, it features a short blade extending from both ends of a long hilt. It follows the same statistics as a short sword, except that it weighs twice as much, it requires two hands to use, and it may be used as a main and offhand weapon at once as if fighting with a short sword in each hand. If, however, this somewhat unwieldy weapon is not to their liking, inhabitants may take a light crossbow and bolts for self-defense. Or, for more subtle eliminations, a hand crossbow is available, replete with two doses of green blood oil being an ingested poison with a DC 10 constitution saving throw, poisoning the target for one minute on a fail. The major faiths of the Moon Sea are Bane, Cyric, Leviator, Mask, Talos, Talona, and Umbali. The North holds a general theme of being the scary frontier in contrast to the nicer parts of Faerun. For its part, the Moon Sea evokes an echo of the theme of 
Orientalism being the historical tradition of depicting the East from a Western perspective in order to highlight the superiority of the Occident. Thus the Moon Sea is painted in pretty broad strokes as a violent, fearsome place of petty conflict and strange weapons. For my part, I suspect that any story that brings this land into focus and draws back the curtain on this vilified nation would find the Moon Sea far more measured than this narrative of difference entails. Once home to a mighty devil worshipping empire, today Narfel is a land of vast plains, populated by nomadic tribal communities with strong traditions of horsemanship, collectively known as the Nars. Though the people here live largely free of their dark past, from time to time Batazu will return to try to hold the survivors of this fallen empire to account for the pacts made by their ancestors. To the west, King Vladimir is further confounded by the Nars tribesmen riding to raid his caravans in Damara and making off with the precious bloodstone. Inhabitants of Narfil speak Damaran as their common tongue and their regional equipment reflects their warlike culture. Elite warriors among the Nars ride a large and highly sought after breed of horse unique to the area. And as such, they may take a war horse with a saddle and with studded leather barding as their regional equipment to take part in lightning raids. While those who fight on foot comprise disciplined pike formations specialized in enduring cavalry charges, and thus they may take a lance and a kukri, being a curved dagger that deals slashing damage, perfectly shaped for slitting throats. The major faiths of Narfil are Lathander, Tempus, and Joaquin. Narfil represents a fairly orientalist view of steppes people, such as the Hunnic tribes of Attila, who once conquered half the known world. Today we find Narfil as a colonial empire well past decline, and now in stagnation. But beyond the fairly thin depiction of barbarian culture, I think that there is fertile ground here to flesh out a story that reflects the kingdoms of the Carpathians, such as Transylvania, with its dark history, its haunted scenery, and its fierce resistance to invaders. South of Narfel and formerly part of the old Narfel Empire is the frontier land of the Great Dale. Various wars have caused the region to be abandoned multiple times over its history. Today it is ruled by a council of druids that oversee the needs of the various human settlers who inhabit the area. When King Vladimir's wars began, the Great Dale declared neutrality in the conflict, but have recently begun to send aid to Damara and the Vast. After Impulturian forces began building military settlements on their western shores to secure Impulta's eastern border. Inhabitants of the Great Dale speak Damaran as their common tongue, and in the forested lands they favour bows, and may take either a long bow with arrows or a short bow with arrows. These bows are not to the quality seen in the Dale lands, but one can hardly argue this point with an arrow in flight. Alternatively, if inhabitants wish to 
aid the Druids in tending to the land and its people. They may take a healer's kit and two antitoxins for their trouble. The major faiths of the Great Dale are Chontia, Eldath, Mirliki, and Sylvanus. The Great Dale completes the theme of colonialism by situating the unsettled frontier whose native people see the high ships on the horizon and are only just waking to the dangers posed by the new arrivals on their shore. Perhaps the Iroquois nations of North America or the Kingdom of Saxony during the time of Charlemagne might be an apt comparison. South of the Great Dale is the nation of Thesk, which once was also a part of Old Narfel. Thesk is situated right along the Golden Way, being the trade route that connects Faerun with the wealth of Karatur. Thesk has grown wealthy and tolerant thanks to the distant travellers that pass through their kingdom. Most inhabitants are merchants or farmers, and Thesk is a gateway for the sharing of arts and culture between Faerun and Karatur. Its political system is kind of deliberately made confusing to outsiders, but basically boils down to rulership by a council of wealthy interests. Both Great Mulhoran to the south and King Vladimir to the west would like nothing more than to control this extremely lucrative trade lane. So the rulers of Thesk work night and day to play their two neighbours against one another. Inhabitants of, the Th of Thesk speak Damaran as their common tongue and they prefer diplomacy and trade to conflict disfavouring heavy armour and tending to carry tools over weapons. They may take regional equipment, therefore, consisting of studded leather armour and, depending upon their profession, either thieves' tools, a healer's kit, or one musical instrument of their choice. The major faiths of Thesk are Chontia, Mask, Shondakul, and Joaquin. Situated at the mouth of a clear analogue for the Silk Road, Silk Road, Thesk is surrounded by enemies and ill-equipped for anything but diplomacy and a defensive war. To me, they reflect the Byzantine Empire in decline, caught in a vice between Venice and the Ottomans. Thank you, magpies! And today, Today we met a cold and dark depiction of a northern land frozen in the shadow of imperial excess. So next time we should crank up the heat and sail east to the deserts and the savannas that enround ancient empires, god kings and great Mulhorand. Now the single largest empire in all of Faerun. But fear not, I will see you through as your guide and as your storyteller.